Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 305 of the Juice Box Podcast. Today's episode is part of the After Dark series. That began back on episode 274 when Maya came to tell us all about drinking and diabetes. Do you remember that one? Very good. And then again in episode 283, Alex came on to talk about smoking weed with type 1. And today, Donnie's going to tell us about some traumas in his life and his battle with addiction. So if your kids are in the car, not not this time, okay? And any kids who listen on their own, please stop the program. Go tell your parents. Scott said, this one's probably not for me. But ask them if they'll listen to it first. Maybe they'll tell you it's okay. I don't know. I'm not in charge. Your mom and dad are. Today, the podcast is sponsored by Touched by Type 1. You can go to touchedbytype1.org to find out more. The podcast is also sponsored by the insulin pump that my daughter has been using since she was four years old, the Omnipod. Omnipod, of course, is the world's only tubeless insulin pump. You're going to love it. Actually, you can get a free no-obligation trial, a little demo pod sent right to your house by going to myomnipod.com forward slash juice box. The podcast is also sponsored by Dexcom, makers of the G6 Continuous Glucose Monitor. The G6 is the foundation of how we make all of our insulin decisions with my daughter. And then, of course, we put them into practice with the Omnipod. Check out Dexcom at Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. There are links to all of the sponsors in the show notes of your podcast app. And, of course, at juiceboxpodcast.com. Thank you for supporting the sponsors. This is a long episode, so we're just going to jump in. Before we do, though, I have to tell you that nothing you hear on the Juicebox podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise, and to always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. This is Donnie. I'm not going to, I thought about this a lot. I'm I'm not going to hide what happened. I'm not going to ask you to come on and pretend we never spoke before. That just, that'll be still to me sound (laughs) silly. I'm more worried about like, damn, it was so good last time. I hope we can repeat it. So I, I really did have that thought. Um, and I'm recording now. Like I just thought it, it was so perfect. Like when you and I got finished, I thought I looked at my schedule and I was like, I'm going to move that and that and that I'm putting Donnie's out right away. Um, oh. It's just like it's so perfect, and I was <laughs> so plus I was so excited. And I was like, "This is great!" I felt like I learned something. I felt like, you know, like, it, and not only that, as crazy as it is, while you and I were recording, we both found out together that Kobe Bryant died in a helicopter crash. Yeah, and it kind of fit into the conversation, and it sure did. There's no way to repeat. I mean. You know, we're not repeating that again. Hopefully, my God, no. can you imagine if someone else dies while we're recording? <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, yeah. no, let's let's not. Let's oh my gosh! <laughs> you know what though? Like, I just listened to one of your podcasts, and I I'm sorry, I don't remember the name, but it was the woman who her children died in a car accident. Yeah, that one's tough, huh? And uh, like, uh, I don't know, dude. Like, you know, to do this once, and I was kind of the same way with sports. I could do it the first time. Second time is always difficult. Third time, I'm good. I got it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was uh, I was like, oh, you know, I'm a little nervous to do it again. And like, I'm just kind of a nervous person. And then I was like listening to that podcast. And I was like, oh, I'm supposed to do this the second time. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. And, I, and I'll tell you, too, I think yours is going to have a very similar impact as hers has. I sent Anne an email yesterday with no fewer than 30 notes for her that came in. Um, and they all had a very similar theme, which was, I didn't, you know, I, I'm always thinking about how difficult this is for me and how much I don't want to be doing it. And what she said just made me realize I, I need to be grateful that I'm here and I'm doing this. So, And the fact that she did it for our community when she, you know, doesn't need to, she wanted to. Yeah. And I think that says a lot for human nature, mankind, uh, when you find the right people, you know, life can be okay. Yeah. 
No, I, I agree with you. I'm, I'm glad you listened to that one. That one, I, I, um, I get notes from people that are kind of private. They're like, oh, that must have been difficult. And you know, I'm like, well, it's not as difficult as it being her story, you, you know, obviously. Sure. Um, but I recorded it with her. Then I edited it. And then I put the ads into it at the front, the back, the bumpers. So then there's more time I'm listening to it. And then the last thing I do is I listen through it for audio. And so I had heard it four times by the time you heard it. And it's, it, it doesn't get easier as you're listening. Like I cry at the same places every time I'm listening to it. So hopefully that that's meaningful and it'll, it, it's helping pe- more people than I'm, I'm hearing back from even I imagine. Oh, I'm sure. Um, oh, so I'm glad. Okay. So I just have to find a way. Do you, do you have any ability? Uh, actually, I know what to do. Hold on one second. I'm going to kind of artificially volume you up on this side, I think. Yeah, I'm not sure why I sound so far away. I apologize. I'm using the same headphones from last time. No, it's my, it's, I have a little setting here. I'm just going to move it up for my, for myself. Yeah, there we go. You're perfect. Okay. So <clears throat> it's hundred percent possible that some of that's going to stay in, but still we're going to introduce you and, and get started. Uh, sure. go ahead, introduce yourself first and then I'll explain to everybody why it is you and I are speaking twice and they're only hearing you once. <laughs> sure. Uh, well, my name is Donnie. I am an addict in recovery and I have type one diabetes. Okay. And so any of you that have listened to the show know that I had a piece of software auto update and it changed a setting and that I lost three conversations that I had because of that setting. And very, very regrettably, Donnie's was one of them. Um, he and I did 90 minutes together that I thought were riveting and enlightening. Um, I felt like we listened. I felt like I was listening to Donnie have like personal, you know, epiphanies, uh, going and, and he explains things about his life in a way that, and Donnie, I truly mean this, that you explain things to me in a way that took me to a place that I had not personally experienced. And it made it crystal clear to me, your perspective and why, what you were saying is something that I, as a person who doesn't have the experience, should just accept. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, not, not hear yeah. and think, oh, he's probably saying this because of that. Or, but I just thought this is, I understand what you're saying. So, well, I appreciate that. Not at all. I don't think you're going to lose that skill in our second recording. And um, for all of you who are wondering, I'm seeing Donnie's voice and I've listened back to it and it's all being recorded. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so let's go. Glad uh, you're doing your job, Scott. <laughs> in fairness, Donnie, you <laughs> you did all the stuff we talked about, right? And and you came through. You showed up and you were like, listen, I got the life experiences. I've got the stories. I'm putting them out. All you got to do is record them. <laughs> I mean, if you would have told me, I would have hit record on my end. I didn't realize. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I didn't know I had to do all the stuff. Um, <laughs> hold on one second. I have to ask. I'm going to help Arden with her blood sugar for one second. Um, oh, hold on a second. Did you test? Arden's on the first day of a Dexcom sensor. And, okay. And in, I am a, um, I'm a, a, a fervent believer in testing on the first day, um, until it settles in. I don't know if that oh, makes okay. sense to people who use Dexcom. Maybe, um, I did when I, uh, first got it, but, yeah. It's yeah. mine's never off. Isn't that nice? How it's so interesting because I hear back from people who are like, Oh, mine on the first day, or this happens. And I'm always like, Well, this is my experience. It always works terrific. I'm a little ca- more careful on the first day. And just by careful, I mean, I test more frequently, um, or I ask Garden to. And then um, after that, I'm with you. I just I roll with it. I think you can tell as a Dexcom user, like, you know when it's working. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, and yeah. and it hits a, a long sweet spot during the sensor. But I do hear other people who say differently, and I never, um, I, you know, I have no perspective. So I'm like, ah, oh, it's not what happens to us. I don't know how to talk to you about it. It's and, so crazy how the same disease affects everyone so differently, like no, so no. differently. It's crazy. It, and it's and it really does sometimes come down to it. it's like body chemistry. It's you know, it's something as simple as hydration or you know. I, one of Arden's friends says that when she gets her period, it gets a little wonky for a while, you know, all kinds of weird stuff. So, okay. So I want her to calibrate 
Yes. I don't think I've calibrated my G6 once. And that's something. Yeah, no. only the first I mean, time. I sometimes like if I if my two hour sensor warm up is at like a funky little period, like if I want to go to the gym and work out, I'll test. But normally I'll time that two hour window uh, when I'm not doing anything or like after a meal or, mm-hmm. you know, things like that. It's interesting. It really is. And like I said, a, a couple of hours from now. I won't think about this again. I'll just, yeah. I'll, see, I'll see it settled in and I'll be like, this is perfect. Plus she had a big breakfast. So I wanted to be doubly sure before we, we address some, you know, put insulin in. Um, yeah. Ab- you know, ab- with the last time we spoke and you were talking about like, she just got done eating pancakes. I was so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I want pancakes too. Donnie, my, um, my speaking stuff is picking up now. I'm going, going this weekend, two weekends after four weekends after that. So I haven't eaten more than like, I don't think 30 carbs in a day for like a week and a half. <laughs> I'm trying, <laughs> trying to get to that spot where I, I think to myself, oh, I wouldn't mind looking at me for an hour. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. Summer is coming. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Now, the beautiful thing about me in this scenario is I have no memory of what we did. So I only have the feelings from it because I think that's just sort of how my brain works. So sure. I could, I might repeat something word for word. I may not. I, I, sure, that's okay. I toyed with the idea of going back and listening to my side of the recording to hear what I said and wrote down my questions. And I thought that's just going to sound rehearsed and I don't want to do that, you know? So sure. we'll dig back in. And I apologize. And for everyone listening, know this Donnie goes deep. He remembers hard things in his life and he talks about them honestly. And now I'm making them, I'm making him do it twice inside of a month. So uh, <laughs> it's okay. He's going above and beyond for us here. Um, I, guess, I just spoke uh, on Friday at a treatment center, so I, it, you're good. I'm fresh. <laughs> You'll run out of tears eventually. <laughs> uh, okay, I guess start at the beginning, really. How old were you when you were diagnosed with type 1? Um, I was 11 or 12 years old. I, I remember having a newspaper route and having a low, and I knew something was way off. Um like I could just feel that I'm in trouble. Um, went to the doctor; they couldn't, they didn't really, you know, see anything wrong. And it was actually discovered by my eye doctor. My right eye was actually protruding much farther than my left. And at that time, they said that was a sign of diabetes, and they got me to an optom- opt- ophthalmologist. Okay. Well, that's a weird path, isn't it? Yeah, totally. Oh, there's nothing. There's nothing normal about my life. <laughs> I have to be honest with you. When we were done talking last time, I thought Donnie has a lot of stories. I don't have any of those stories. That's really amazing. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, I feel like I can make a lifetime TV movie. <laughs> All right, listen, we're about to do that. I think so. Um, so diagnosed at 11, and yes. what was the what was like living with diabetes like for you at 11? How old are you now? I am 40. Okay, so that's not long ago. 29 years. Actually, that's 29. a long ass time, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, twenty nine years ago, I'm guessing. Well, tell me what what treatment was like back then for you. Like, what were your day to days like? Uh, a lot of guessing, a lot of panic. Um, the insulin I was using back then was the two hour quick acting. You know, you had to take your shot two hours before a meal. Um, pricking my finger. Um, Back then, I was calorie counting and basically following a little plate chart and like eat your fruit, eat your vegetables, da 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 da. Very, uh, I I, want to say not very scientific, but it was not very helpful by any means. Um, I actually found a blood sugar log from when I was in the 11th grade and like, holy shit, it didn't feel good. Like my sugars were all over the place. Um, So I felt like there at that time in my life and for probably most of my life up until the last two years, I didn't have very good knowledge or control of my diabetes. So that, and we'll get to it, but you've, you lived the first 27 years with type one, not like you've lived the last two really. No, no, not even close. All right. So um, this is where I, I think we have to just jump in here and to set the stage and say, um, you know, I, I'd like I'd like your remembrance of how how we met, and I'll I'll give you mine after. Sure. So, um, 
Well, like I had mentioned earlier, I am in recovery and I had met you three months in, um, you know, life was going pretty good except for my diabetes. Um, I reached out onto a Facebook group and, uh, I pretty much was ready to relapse. I had, I think my blood sugar was 400. I basically, it was a cry for help that I posted. And I was like, I just don't know what to do. I feel like, you know, this is a a, a lose-lose situation for me. I had no idea how much my diabetes was affecting my poor coping skills, which was drugs. Um, So someone had responded with your name and you had reached out and we had talked uh, a little bit online. And then we actually ended up exchanging telephone numbers and we had talked in person. Mm. And at that moment <clears throat> when we had talked, I mean, it was pretty bad. Uh, it was not a good night. Let's just put it that way. Mm. Um, you know, at that point in my life, I knew drugs were not an option anymore. And I was worried that I was going to go farther than that. So again, and I know I tell you this all the time, Scott, I really appreciate you being in my life. Uh, you really helped turn me around and get me to, uh, the correct resources that I need to be able to handle this. It's my pleasure. It absolutely is. And by the way, there's a small percentage of the people listening who believe that I wiped out your recording and made you do it again so that you'd have to say thank you twice. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) That's a bastard. (laughs) So, um, so I, I, I just very interestingly, since we recorded the first time till now, put out an episode that I recorded back around the time you and I spoke. And it was interesting because I said to that person, I just had a conversation with someone privately and I have to be honest with you. I I wasn't sure if I should have the conversation when it, while I was having it. And, and so, you know, Donnie describes he's three months into recovery. Things aren't going well. When he says he's thinking he might do something worse than drugs next time, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you're thinking what, where, what's next? I thought I was going to commit suicide. Okay. And so try to imagine that you meet a person on Facebook who's like, Hey, I need help with my diabetes. And people say you can help. And then the person that gets on the phone with you is in recovery, does not want to go back to drugs and doesn't think there's another way out of it. And now suddenly you're having a conversation with that person. So from my perspective, the first 20 minutes or so, I just kind of let Donnie talk. Like I really, like he was, um, I, I, I described it as, uh, I felt like I could feel you vibrating through the phone. Do you know what I mean? Like you were, you were yeah. frenetic and, um, and we finally, like, I finally kind of let you talk yourself out a little bit. And I just said, look, I think we could get your blood sugar under control and maybe that would help. And here's how. And then I don't know how much time we spent on the phone, me talking about, you know, tug of wars and all that, all that stuff that I talk about, about insulin. Um, and I really believe it was the next morning that you sent me a note saying, like, look at my graph. And you had slept through the night, maybe? Like, that was the big deal, if I'm remembering right? It was the first time I made it through the night without my sugar spiking or having to wake up at 3 a.m. and checking it. Yeah. And it just first it, time in a very, very, very long time. If you can remember back, what is like? Can you remember how that felt? Because you were elated when we spoke. Um, it felt like I actually had a chance of living. Um, so I guess we can kind of just at that moment go into it because you know, <laughs> listening to it now, I'm just like, God, I was so pathetic. But you know what? I was. I was in a really, really bad place in my life, mm-hmm. which started this journey. Mm-hmm. Um. So, you know, Scott, if it's okay with you, I'm just going to go. Go to it. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, and I know, and I always start this conversation with that key, that secret to keep me sick, and I choose not to be sick anymore. Um, I was molested from the age 7 to 10, and it was pretty traumatic. And I held on to that for most of my life. And then here I am at 11 years old and find out I have type 1 diabetes. So I'm already going into life not feeling equal to anyone else. And what I mean by that is like, if I was a football player, I felt like I was always standing around with the basketball players. You know what I'm saying? So let's add another traumatic experience on top of it. So I basically learned to handle myself through drugs. And what I mean by handle myself was I was able to get out of myself with drugs and, uh, you know, God willing, in two weeks, I will be 18 months clean. 
And that's a huge accomplishment for me because I have used since I was basically 15 years old. That's, that's amazing. I when you when you say that, the first thing that pops into my mind is imagine being molested. Not that you could even imagine it if you didn't, but something as traumatic as that happening to you from the age of seven till ten, and then it stops mercifully, and then you get type one diabetes. Like that's just that's crazy. It's like it's yeah, it's like it being a lot. In, it's like being in a car accident pulling yourself out of the wreckage and feeling like, Oh, I can't believe it. I'm not dead. And then another car coming by and hitting you again. <laughs> exactly. Right. You know, just really crazy. Um, yeah. Uh, and so you used, how did, what, where does, how does drug use start for a person that age? Like, where does it begin? Um, I would say that it started recreationally with, you know, some alcohol, but I would never really was a drinker. Thank God my mother instilled that into my head that you never really drink alcohol with diabetes. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> so it started with, uh, you know, marijuana and then the disease progresses and things get harder and harder. Um, so I guess the direction I would want to say is, you know, when I was in college, I tore my Achilles tendon. And I just ended up having an endless supply of Percocets. So one of the things that came with the Percocets is people who wanted Percocets. So if you can kind of be in my shoes at the moment of never really feeling like I fit in, never really feeling like I'm equal, I've now found a group of people that wanted me around. They didn't want me around for me. They wanted me around for my drugs. So that filled another void. You know what I'm saying? So like it made me feel like a real person. And it also just created my addiction to go deeper and deeper. Um, so the loneliness that I felt from being molested was very much intertwined with drug use. And that is something that I work on to this day. When you're finished listening to Donnie and I today, I hope you take a second to go to Dexcom.com forward slash juice box and learn more about the Dexcom G6 continuous glucose monitor. In a nutshell, a continuous glucose monitor is a device you wear that gives you the speed and direction and number that your blood sugar is constantly. So you can see your blood sugar in real time, how it's moving and how fast it's moving. This is going to help you make way better decisions with your insulin. And the importance of that cannot be overstated. Once you can see how food and insulin impacts your blood sugar, you can begin to make decisions that are in your best interest in real time stopping those spikes, catching lows before they happen. On top of all that, if you're the loved one or caregiver of someone who has type 1 diabetes, you have the ability to follow them, see their data when they're not with you. This could mean anything from a friend living across the country to a child asleep down the hall. Anywhere that there's an internet connection, their phone takes their information, sends it up to the cloud, comes back down to yours. You're going to get customized alerts and alarms for highs and lows that are going to tell you, hey, now's the time to act. Let's do something here before something happens that takes more to stop. These little adjustments are a huge deal. Trust me. If you don't know what I'm talking about, listen to the rest of the podcast episodes and you'll figure it out. But for now, Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. It is imperative. So basically, the last five years of my life has been the roughest. I had lost my mom to brain cancer, and I had found crystal meth. And someone had said to me, you know, hey, I know you're having a really hard time. You know, you should try this drug just to really get your mind off it. And this, and well, I got my mind off it. It took my mind away. Um, <clears throat> basically, it makes you crazy. (laughs) I mean, it's so strong that, uh, I knew I was in trouble right away, but I also knew that I couldn't really handle my life at that moment. I was losing my mom. I lost my career. I really didn't have much at that moment. So, um, does that circle just feed itself? Like, so you describe being around people and that feeling good. So you have a, you, you have drugs in your life, which bring other people in who want drugs and now you have a circle of friends, whether they really are or not. It's how it feels. Yeah. And, and so do you think the person who offers you the crystal the first time is trying to feed their circle? 
by pulling you into their situation? Like, is it, is that the vibe? Like I need more people around me. I'll use the drugs to get more people around me. Or like, does that make sense? Or am I, am I making, no, it does make sense. But I think from my end, I was filling a circle. And I think from his end, he was filling a circle, but his circle is not friendship. His circle is trying to get someone else hooked and make money off of. Okay. So at that moment in my life, um, the circle that I had filled, who I thought were my friends, uh, were not friends. And I ended up going through a horrible identity theft, losing everything uh, because of these people. So here are the people that are consoling me for my mother's death, trying to be there for me. And I realize they are emptying every, everything I have in my pockets at the same time. So it was a very, very hard situation to go through. Um, and that is when I entered rehab the first time. Yeah. I want to, I want to say, because you're probably like either cognitively or not cognitively avoiding saying some of the things you said the first time, but just so you realize when Donnie's, um, uh, uh, stuff was stolen from him, including his identity so badly that the government had to reissue him a new social security number. This, yeah. this happened when he asked these people to dog sit for him. Am I right? While you were going where? To my mom's funeral. Yeah. So uh, that stuck with me uh, from the last time. Like, so you, there's no, you just have to try to imagine a person who would steal from you while you're at your mother's funeral. And that's, and what the situation, what their situation is too. Like, you know, we're talking about yours, but I think that there's a lot of, um, I mean, I'm going to use Anne's word from a couple episodes ago, but I think there's a lot of grace you have to have for those people as well. Right? Like, everyone uh yes but it took me a long time to get there i would imagine oh in the moment i wouldn't have it i'm talking about listening to you now like that you know well like and i think the hard part was well, you know i didn't really find out that they were that this was happening until i after until i got out of treatment the first time so it was kind of like a late onset <laughs> effect with this all wow so you know here i am uh going to treatment for the first time I wouldn't say I didn't think I had a drug problem. I, I definitely needed a break in life. So I didn't really know what I was getting myself into. Um, I went on the recommendation of my family. And what I mean by that was I was, I don't want to say forced, but I was basically thrown into a rehab that I had no choice over. So like when I say I didn't really know what I was getting myself into, I checked in to rehab with 90 day supply of Xanax for my nerves. I had no idea. So when I showed up and they're like going through my bags and I do my piss test and they're like, you just piss dirty. And I was like, what do you mean I piss dirty? I haven't done that. And they're like, you just piss uh, dirty for uh, Xanax. And I was like, well, of course I did. I'm nervous as hell. Here's my Here's my script. Here's my bottle. <laughs> How am I going to get through this without Xanax? Yeah, I was like, you're, like, what are you talking about? I was like, these are mine. It's okay. They have my name on it. <laughs> so I had no idea. So I actually got sent home. I wasn't allowed to check in. And I had to detox at home by myself oh. for two weeks. And I had to buy <laughs> a piss test on Amazon to prove to my dad that I was clean so we could drive back down there. Because that was probably the hardest thing to... Uh, to see my dad's face when I pissed dirty and I couldn't get in and I didn't do it on purpose. I was just trying to get through the day. Right. You know what I mean? You see, it, it's almost like the, you know, at that certain time in the nineties, if you were a baseball player and you're like, I don't do steroids. I'm just using this, this powder that my trainer gave me. Yeah. I'm not trying to get high. I'm just trying to keep my nerves calm so I can be here. And so talk about that for a couple of minutes. It, it, you described yourself early on as a nervous person. Is that lifelong? Is that after the molestation? Is that, where does that, you know, I think that was after the molestation, because when I remember, like, I was five or six, I was a really happy person. I didn't really have, I was a very carefree, I didn't really worry about things like that. So that definitely came from being molested. Mm -hmm. And that has carried me through mo most of my life. The last two years, things have been getting a lot better. But I, Scott, I didn't finish college the first time because I was too scared to go to finals. I was too scared to do reports in front of the class. Like, I... Honestly, I think I dropped speech class five times because I just couldn't do it. Do you think? And you, now all I and now all I do is speak. <laughs> you can't give it a shut up. <laughs> do you think that's an um maybe an, a, a multiplication of your flight or fright response, like flight or oh, flight? 100%. Yeah, hundred percent. So in your mind, someone's always about to do something bad to you. 
Yes, that's yeah. pretty much how I lived my life. Wow. What does this person want from me? And hopefully they won't hurt me as bad as I've already been hurt. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, well, Donnie, hold on a second. That's, I'm just going to pull myself together here. That's hard to think about. Uh, um, I, 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 I want to just take a half a second here. Not something you could have stopped. It's not like your parents were not paying attention to you. This is a, a, a predatory situation. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, you said before that you can spot people like that now. Yes. What, so how, how I think, mean? I don't know. It's just a gut instinct. I have taught children most of my life. And unfortunately, when there are children around, there are usually predators around and I can spot them. I can spot, I have a really good intuition. I can tell when people have malicious intent and, uh, when I have been around other coaches that have the wrong intent, I can usually tell. And it's little stuff, right? Like it's a teacher who calls you cutie or it's uh, something like why, that. Right? Why, why are you giving that kid a juice box and she doesn't have diabetes? Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Things like that. Just trying to keep them kind of connected to you a little close by, like building these weird relationships. Maybe they'll never, maybe they will, or maybe they won't ever do anything, but they're trying to put themselves in a space around this child that they're, they're, that they're a good person. Yeah, yeah. And and so that maybe that kid becomes comfortable and then there's a moment when they can and they let their guard yeah. down. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I used to my when I was younger, I didn't think of this last time we spoke, but when I tried to make a point about people, when I was younger, I used to say, Go to the mall. Statistically, there's a child molester in there. Like like right, like they're they're just this. Statistically, there's this many people who blah blah blah. There's this like it's just when you, whenever you get a group of people together it's big enough, you've, you're going to get a sample size of a lot of things. And and some of those things are, are behaviors that most of us can't believe even exist. Right. Like it's, yeah. that's, that's why it's so frighteningly shocking because you're just like, why no one would do that. I would never do that. No one would do that, but it's not true. So no, there's a lot of people out there that will. Yeah. Um, so do you, well, you said you ended up working with kids for a while. Um, was that, how long did you do that for? I have been a gymnastics coach for most of my life. Um, I started gymnastics around the age of 12, 13, right around the time of diabetes. And I think that was like my escape. Um, I really, really, it was really my first addiction. Um, I completely could get out of myself when I was in gymnastics. I could completely just get lost in that world. Yeah. And I never really left it. So, you get, so I've right. been I've been coaching for since I was probably sixteen, seventeen years old, and I still do it to this day, uh, part time. And you were really you're very like you successful, right? Like this was a good time in your life. This, yeah, I don't like to toot my own horn, but yes, I I I did it very very well. Right. I've had probably over eighty kids get full rides to college. Um, I have put kids on the national team for USA Gymnastics, and uh, I've won every level in USA Gymnastics. You high that whole time? No. 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 You know, and that was the weird thing, because that's what the part that I thought I never really had a problem, because I was such a codependent. I would get lost in my sport. It was my drug. Right. You know what I'm saying? I would completely be involved 24-7 doing lesson plans. Uh, coaching extra hours, working seven days a week, that I would completely get lost in it. I remember the first time in college, maybe a little bit older than college age, but I was working for a gym that ended up giving us a break for Thanksgiving, like a five, six day break, which is unheard of in gymnastics, especially when you're good at gymnastics, you just don't take breaks. Mm -hmm. And I remember not being able to handle myself. And like, that's when the drugs were very, very bad. And I was, shock I, I hate saying the word shock but like i was like some of the behaviors that i was doing i ended up in a different state hmm. hi you know what i mean like just really off the wall behaviors because they i had a hard time sitting with myself wow. yeah i you know it's funny i was talking to someone the other day it feels disconnected from this but i don't think it is and they were telling me how their relationship is good when they and their partner have someone else to be angry at at the same time so when there's a third party messing with them they can kind of come together as a as a team and be angry at this third party person 
But if there's no one to be angry with, if there's no drama moving around in their life, they turn it on each other. And and I wonder like how much of that is just that they have something else to focus on at the time. You, yeah. you know what I mean? Because gymnastics, I mean, that's obviously you're you're in your own head, but you're so I'm imagining focused on something that you can't think of anything except what you're doing. Yes. Right. And then and when I don't have to worry when I don't have to sit there and think and feel about myself, yeah. I was okay. Yeah. Wow. So that's a lot of years of stuffing things down. A lot of years. So any like I kind of look at it like as if I lived in two different worlds. And it took me a very long time and a lot of therapy to combine these two worlds together. Cause like when I was in my one world in my career, I was completely fine. And what I wasn't is when life was a disaster. I really didn't have my family cause they didn't know me. I didn't know me. I didn't want them to know the me that I knew, you know? So I was very good at hiding. I was very good at living that double life. And I'm a, I'm a pretty good manipulator. I can hide things from people and I can make things look good on the outside when, when they're not. I wonder what it's like, and if you can explain, when the focus, the ability to focus on something goes away when you are with yourself, is it, are they actual conscious thoughts that creep in? Is it, are there feelings? Like what, what drives you to, to use then? Like, like, I don't understand that part, I guess. Mm, So I think it would be the uncomfortability and the unmanageability. And then if you want to add the mental illness on top of it, it's the insanity. So it's the all the spinning of the negative thoughts that won't stop. It's the obsessiveness. It's the compulsiveness that you have nothing to do. You know, I can't, I'm not working right now. So what am I going to do? You know, uh, it's almost, I don't want to say keeping yourself busy, but it's keeping yourself out of yourself. It's almost like white noise. Say that one more time. Like white noise. Like you create white noise so you can't hear Oh your yeah. Thoughts. Oh yeah. hundred percent. When you say that, like your thoughts, like, are they, are they words? that you hear in your head? Like, I don't mean like, you know what I mean? I don't mean like somebody's talking to you. I mean, like, do you actually feel complete thoughts? Like I used to be molested. I did this. Like, do, does that stuff, or is it just, it, is, it, is mm. it hard to put into words that feeling inside? No, I would think it. So it is words and I'm hearing my own voice, but sometimes they are, uh, the voice is a manifestation from a feeling mm-hmm. or a problem. I can give you an example, and this is kind of like an, a, a random example, but uh, I, uh, okay, so I'm going to go out. I'm going to go out with friends and I'm nervous. Do I wear a blue shirt? Do I wear a red shirt? Does this shirt fit? Oh my God, this looks stupid on me. I can't look in the mirror because I don't like looking at myself. All right, does this shirt work? So I ask a friend, does this red shirt look nice? Yes. Ask the next one. Yes, yes. Okay, so obviously I like red. Okay. Everyone told me that I look good in this red shirt. So red must be my favorite color. I get to the bar. Someone says, Oh God, I really don't like that color. And then your brain just spins, Mm -hmm. spins out of control. It's really, really odd to say, but it's, it's, it's kind of like that. It's like you would, you would question yourself so many times that once someone said something and it would amplify in your head. Mm -hmm. Is that confidence? Is that a lack of confidence? I think that is a lack of acceptance. Okay. How so? I think when someone hurts you in the way I was hurt, it takes away the ability to accept who you are and allow yourself to be equal to others. So it takes away your ability to have your own thoughts, Hmm. your own pride. And I guess you could say confidence but almost like it takes away your leg to stand on. So when that secondary person comes in in that bar situation and says, I don't like you in that color, you, you are without a next step. Correct. Right. Okay. Because you don't know what you like. You don't know what you think you look good in and you're completely being, I I, I guess to some degree that your thoughts are manipulated by other people's opinions. So, and those are ever changing and there's no way for you to even prepare for that. It's really interesting and scary. Well, jeez. Oh, my gosh. All right, Donnie. Let's dig a little farther, shall we? Sure. (laughs) You know what? I don't have a cute way to get to this. How long have you known you were gay? If you're using an insulin pump now with tubing and you'd like to be tubeless, or if you're using pens and you've always wanted to use a pump, you can check out the Omnipod tubeless insulin pump 
without any obligation or cost. All you have to do is go to myomnipod.com forward slash juice box. There's even a link to click on. You don't even have to remember that. When you get there, you'll fill out the tiniest bit of information and Omnipod is going to send you an absolutely free, no obligation demo of their pod in the mail, right to you, wherever you are. I guess wherever you say you are. Once it arrives, you can actually try it on and wear it. Find a site that you think is right for you, shower with it, go about your business, and you'll notice, I think, in no time at all, that you forget the pods there. And that's when you're going to realize, I could have my insulin with me like this. Boluses and basal changes at a push of a button. Completely untethered, nothing touching it. That button I'm talking about you pushing it's on another small device that you keep in your pocket or your purse. It does not have to be on you, hanging all over the place. You only need it when you need it. Imagine just taking something out of your pocket at a restaurant. It looks like a phone. Nobody knows what it is. Push, push, push. Back in your pocket. Here comes your insulin. It's pretty damn terrific. Arden's been using the Omnipod since she was four years old, and she's worn one every day since then. She's over 15 now. I think it is an absolute treasure. I think you would like it as well. I know it might seem scary to try something new or to make a switch, but you can do it. And Omnipod will make it easier for you. Myomnipod.com forward slash juice box with the links in your show notes or at juiceboxpodcast.com. How long have you known you were gay? Um, I would say since I was like five years old. I remember... You know, you get the Sunday newspapers and like you get like the, the Kmart ads or like the Kohl's ads and you're flipping through them and you would see the underwear ads. And I knew I was very much attracted to men. Hmm. I wouldn't say I knew that I was gay, but I knew I was different. Okay. Yeah, I guess there's no context for sexuality when you're five. No, because I don't think I don't think you could label it at that age. Right. But you you knew you knew and I knew that was different. And I also think that's what, what these people pr- preyed on. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you think that there's some sort of a, I don't want to call it a sixth A level sense. of uncomfortability ah. within yourself. Ah, okay. So And they preyed on it. Ah, okay. So again, so you have this, oh, it's interesting, isn't it? Like, so being, understanding that you're gay before you understand sexuality just makes you feel unsettled. Different. Different. Yeah. Right. And then that's a feeling you give off and other people can pick up on that. Sure. Think about the shy people in class. Why are they picked on? Because they don't have the confidence. They feel different than someone else. So people choose, instead of accepting it, they try to manipulate it, terrorize it. And that's what bullying is all about, is not allowing people to be who they are and accepting that. Like when, when, you know, think about it. Like you got someone who, you know, kind of doesn't hold their head up. Uh, not real confident with themselves. You can tell that they're not talking, you know, they don't have very many friends. And then uh, he goes and takes shots before he eats. You know, there's a lot of things right there that people just want to pounce on. Right. So you're in a, you're in a deep enough hole that you don't appear to be the kind of person who would stick up for themselves. If I tried to pressure you into something or if I, or if I picked on you, I don't think you'd swing back at me or something like that. Correct. Hmm. Did you know that about yourself? Did that feel weak? You know what? I think I've always known that. Okay. I'm not a violent person. Um, the one fight that I have been in was so bad that the person I almost, I don't even want to go there, but uh, I know that my anger will lead to some heavy violence. So I have to walk away. Yeah. Donnie, I don't have context for your height, but you're a big, strong person. Um, uh, yeah. I'm a, I'm a big boy. I'm 5'11", 225. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, I, you are one of those people who I look at and I think if Donnie decided he wanted to break me in half, he absolutely could. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm a, I am very gentle. I'm a very gentle soul. All right. You can't use this podcast as a dating tool, Donnie. Slow down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, 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 I 100% know that about you from speaking to you and from, and you know, in the times we have that I don't think you'd hurt a fly. But you're saying that there could, that there, there was one time and you are aware that it could have been again that, if you head down that road, there might be no stopping you going down that road. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Mm. Now, <sighs> Jesus, I don't know where to go, man. Like, I, I, I have a thought, <laughs> thought in my head. Your life is 
ha- you know what? Excuse me. Your life prior to uh, your your recovery is just unlike anything that I can imagine working out. Like it just seems like there's too many cards stacked up against you, but somehow that is not how it ended up for you. It's no fascinating. It really didn't. You, you, know. Uh, you know, I think looking back at it all, there was definitely something that was always protected me. And I, I don't know what your religious beliefs are, and I'm not one to impose mine on anyone, but mm-hmm. there's definitely something out there other than me. I'm not in charge. There's the universe or God or whatever you want to call them, Allah on Tuesdays, whatever. It doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. But there was something that was always protecting me. So here I am. I've always known I was a good person, and I've always known that I had a lot of going against me. A lot. And here I am, a hurt kid who has always protected kids and did it well. And like when I say I did it well, Scott, like I'm not bragging about my accomplishments in my career. Mm -hmm. Like I still get Father's Day calls from kids that I coached 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, I got invited to a graduation ceremony at the University of Oklahoma because one of my athletes was speaking and she thanked me in her commencement speech. Mm -hmm. You know, little things like that is what, uh, I, those are my gold medals. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I've always known that I was a good person, but man, I just couldn't get unstuck in life, you know? And uh, it was the drugs. It was holding me back. It was it was not allowing me to deal with things. It wasn't allowing me to cope with things. It wasn't allowing me to accept things, yeah. you know? And I think the big turning point for me was when I went into rehab the first time. And it was long-term treatment. I was supposed to, <laughs> was supposed to say three months, but I stayed two months and 28 days. And while I was there, which was the first time that I'd ever gone a substantial amount of time without using any substances is when I really uncovered, I don't want to say uncovered because I've always known, but really remembered that I was molested. And I remembered the acts and I remembered who they were. And I would remember their grooming techniques and the presence they would give my family and, you know, the threats they would give me if I spoke up. And uh, I, I went back to using because yeah. I was like, how in the world am I supposed to handle this? You know, um, at that point in time, I think everything got worse for the right reasons. You know, this is when I found out that my identity was stolen. Um, so here I am, jobless homeless, living with my family. It wasn't really homeless, but I was not living on my own. And I've been living on my own for a very long time. Um, I had no money. And uh, I know I didn't tell you this the first time, but this is also when I was losing my eyesight. I had cataracts in my eyes. So my driver's license was taken away. I had lost my driver's license and I went to the DMV and to take the vision test and I couldn't see the the little pictures. And I was like, Hmm. so uh, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) no, no, like I couldn't do anything. Like I was seriously like my, my universe was saying, you're going to learn to sit and get better. And, um, I had relapsed. And when I say relapsed, I mean, you know, I, I would say, I guess you can't even say it was really a relapse. I just, I used again, but this time when I used, um, I turned my phone off. And I kind of disappeared and I didn't have my insulin with me and I didn't care. So that's why I call it a relapse because this is like, I've now gone deeper into that, uh, negative space. You know what I'm saying? Um, so from that act, um, I had found a trauma therapist in my town. So I I knew how bad it was. And I was like, this is not good. You know, I was like, Oh, well, you know, you you used and da 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 da. And I was like, Oh no, you have no idea where I went in my head. Um, so I knew I needed a therapist because we had been doing therapy in rehab and it was working. It was helping. I should say. Can I ask you a question before we get to the therapy? Um, and, and just very quickly, it might be my imagination. Is it possible you're moving a piece of paper or doing something with your hands? Yes. Sorry. I'm nervous. No, no, don't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sit on your hands for me, okay? (laughs) No, 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 you're fine. Um, Sorry about that. No, no, don't be sorry. Um, So my question here is, what does it, what does your, what does your management for your diabetes look like throughout this entirety of time? So, you know, are you concerned about it? Or are you just giving yourself enough insulin to stay alive? Like, what was it? 
cognitive? Did you just give yourself insulin when you thought about it? Like, how did you manage? And I mean, like, through the decades, like, what was your process? So, well, I wouldn't say it was good, but I wouldn't say I would neglect it. I would definitely, like, you know, at that time I was taking Lantus, so I had the 24-hour insulin, and I was taking whatever log at the time, a Humalog, Novalog, I can't really remember right. what I was taking, but I had my short acting, my long acting. I would always take them, but um, I didn't really care because once, <laughs> and I hate saying it like this, but like I would prick my finger, the number would be skyrocket. I would take the amount of insulin I think I should take, and then I would get high. Okay. And then if I wasn't getting high, I would go to work. So again, I would deal with it for that 30 seconds. I would allow myself to be me mm -hmm. and then I would go and escape either through work or I'd do it through other unhealthy coping. I think you just said something that I've seen <clears throat> a number of times with people who um, are in that scenario and just really aren't worried about their, their blood sugar, their health, their diabetes health. The idea of I'm using my slow acting insulin. So at least I have that. I've heard so many people say that. Um, so I, and like, not to interrupt you, but like no. at this point, like here, I've already been molested. Uh, my life's in shambles. I'm hiding in a career that I did love, but I was basically killing myself with. Um, I just figured at that point and I hate my truth. I wasn't going to live past the age of 40 because I figured once I lost my legs, I was going to kill myself. And I didn't think that was going to be long very far away so the, i honestly thought i'd be done by 40 so the idea was i'll manage this well enough to keep me going at some point the diabetes will catch up to me something horrific is going to happen to me and that's when i'll end my life sure why not everything else is happening to me <laughs> yeah well at, there's at no point during decades of your life did anything happen that would make you feel like hey maybe this will get better or, you know, maybe there's a way to make it better. There was, there just nothing existed for you like that. And that's, it's so interesting, like to, to sort of start for a second and recap, you have something terrible happen to you as a child that puts you in a psychological tailspin that you can't break free of. Um, you know, the explanations of how it happened are horrific, but the fact is that it happened and now you're having that, those feelings. Then you get diabetes. Now these things are compounded upon themselves and then and tell us again, what time, what age did you start using? Uh, 14 or 15. So you made it from 10, About two years. Yeah. You made it a year from molestation to diabetes. Then you made it two years from diabetes and your memories to using, I guess that's about when you probably just couldn't handle it anymore. The, the ideas of what had happened to yourself. And was anyone managing with you when you were 11, 12, 13, 14, were you doing it on your own? What was that like in the beginning? Um, I was I was mostly doing it on my own. My mom tried to help. Um, I remember going to the diabetes educator and sitting there for like seven hours because like I wouldn't take a shot. And every time they would give me a needle to take the shot, I'd break it. <laughs> so I probably broke like over 400 syringes that day. And I just remember seeing my mom crying and was like, please do this. So I did it. I've always been a mama's boy. Mm. Um, but no one has ever given me a shot. I've always done it myself. Okay. Um, so, and that, and nothing was ever really managed. Like I started with like a regular, like general practitioner doctor who didn't really know what the f they were doing. Um, you know, back then the technology really wasn't there. Um, but I don't think I've ever had an A1C that was in the eight, like not until the last two years of my life. I was always in the nines or tens. Always nines or tens. Yeah. Yeah, I am. I'm, I don't have a follow up question for this, but at what point do your parents become knowledgeable about the molestation? How old are you when they know? Um, well, that's hard because they always knew. Um, that's the part where it gets tricky because when I was in rehab and my therapist had called them down to talk about what I discovered. And when we had talked about it, the look on their face and their response about them knowing is what pushed me back out. So, um, you know, <laughs> it's hard. Um, my family loves me the way they know how. Mm -hmm. And I have accepted the fact that what I need from people in my life, I have to go out and find the right people to do that with. 
Um, and I say that as a disclaimer from my own head. Um, but I guess, you know, it is what it is. We're a very Catholic family, Catholic guilt, sweep it under the rug, don't talk about it, mm-hmm. you know, and it's always been that way. And it still is to this day. Well, that's more to deal with than anybody. I, I mean, it, taking out what happened, just the idea that something was happening to you that your parents could have rescued you from and didn't, I don't, that's a lot to deal with. Um, that's just, that's a massive amount of, of knowledge for, for a person to have. I, uh, and I think the hard part was I didn't really remember it until I was 36 years old. Yeah. And that's something. All right. Uh, so you were, so let's get to the good stuff. Yeah, Jesus, let's, <laughs> yeah, before, before everybody listening comes up with their suicide plan. <laughs> so, you know, I had found this amazing trauma therapist. Um, so we worked for about three years Mm -hmm. and this was about the time that I got on the Dexcom and the Omnipod, um, which have been life changing for me. Um, so we would have therapy. I, I would relapse every once in a while. And, you know, um, she had came to me one day and she said that, you know, Hey, I think we're going to have to stop. And I was like, what? I was like, no, I'm paying you a lot of money. Like, this is the only thing I look forward to on a daily basis or weekly basis. Lie, well, I was going like every day. Um, <laughs> I, uh, she was like, well, every time we dig, you relapse. And she's like, and I know they're getting worse. And that was true. It was getting very bad. And uh, she said, I need you to go 30 days without using. And I said, I'll give you 15. And it was probably about day six. I woke up in the middle of the night early morning in a complete panic. I had emailed her and said, I need an emergency appointment because, you know, I'm so important. Like I need to be there the first, first, first appointment of the day. And, uh, I got down there and I, I told her that, uh, I had been lying this whole time. And she said about what, and I said, I never really was molested by the neighbors. I molested them. And she said, explain. And I said, well, I really enjoyed it. I was seeking sex with them. And she said, you have coached children your whole entire life. How many kids do you know from the ages of seven to 10 are sexually active? And I said, none. And she said, this is your brain trying to protect you. And when she had said that is when everything came back. I could hear their voice. I could remember the acts. I can remember the time of day. I could remember my responses. I could remember the fear of responding. I could remember looking out the window and seeing my family from their house while this was happening. Um, and I was free of addiction. I had put it together that I was hurting myself because someone else had hurt me. Mm-hmm. And that basically has been what has been the, the, the fuel to my addiction. You know, you're not going to hurt me. I'm going to hurt me. I'm going to hurt me. I'm going to hurt it with my diabetes. I'm going to hurt it with drug use. I'm going to hurt it with putting bad people in my life. Like no one else is going to hurt me more than I've already been hurt. Yeah. The only power and I had. The only power I had. Yeah. You're right. And at that moment, I was completely free of addiction. I was like, I would never have to pick up a drug ever again. And I felt that. I knew that. I could like, it almost felt like the weight of armor had been lifted that I've been carrying for 37 years of my life. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, at that time in my life, uh, when this was happening, I had no coping skills. I had nothing. I had lost everything. I had lost my mother. I couldn't go and cry on her shoulder. I had lost my career. I had nothing to hide in. I didn't want to use drugs. And I didn't really have the support system that I needed. So I wanted to kill myself. And that, at that time, is what I realized. I was like, whoever is running this world, this ship, You know, God, Allah, Buddha, the universe is evil. Because how could you do this to me? How could you finally make me remember or allow me to remember? And now I'm hurting even more. Mm -hmm. So I checked myself into uh, the hospital and told them what was going on. And they asked me, uh, well, what can we do to help you? And I said, well, I'm trying to get into a rehab in Arizona. I was just running. I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't really going to go. I was just probably going to get a plane ticket and just stay out there or end it. Um, but they had got me into a treatment and it worked. Well, the therapist, she saves you really. Um, 
because because by sending you away to clean up, right, for long enough that your brain came up with another way out of dealing with your thoughts, like taking responsibility for being molested. That was your brain's way of like, I, I don't want to think about these things. Why don't I make them not even a bad thing anymore? And then maybe I can exist through that way. And then she calls you on it. That's like your whole life right there. Like that's where you're, that, that should be your birthday, whenever that was, you, you yeah. know, like that's beautiful. So, oh my gosh. You must send her a, a lovely holiday card. <laughs> oh, I, I still see her. I, I still say. see her. I'm still, oh yeah, yeah we're, she's, I wouldn't be here without her. No kidding. No, that's, it's a beautiful, that, that really is. It's somebody who knew what they were doing and did it well. And, and it paid you back. Like that's, that's terrific. So, so then you go into, now how long ago was that, that moment? Uh, it'll be one, two years, August 28th. So I'm almost at 18 months. Wow. Okay. And so when you, when you're, the process of getting clean, I can't imagine must be pretty terrible on your body and your mind, right? Like not using. Oh, it wasn't easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, it was tough. Um, so it took a while for my body, obviously, to get regulated again. But I think my mind is what's more important because mm -hmm. that's what's in control of everything. And there was a couple key things that really uh, that helped me get to the point where I'm at today. Uh, first and foremost, I had to forgive the first thing, first person I had to forgive was myself. I had to forgive myself for doing the drugs. And then I had to forgive the act of what those people had done to me. And then I had to accept the fact that this was real. And then I had to be okay with it. Yeah. Um, when I think about that, I try to think of those words on a daily basis. Um, because they're, it's my world. You know, it's, it's my truth. You know, when I forget that I did drugs for over 30 years, that's when life's going to get bad for me. You know what I'm saying? Okay. When I put my recovery first and allow myself to live my world through my recovery, everything's okay. Because if I forget that I have the tendency to hurt myself, <laughs> here's, the, here's the thing with addiction, addiction masks self-destruction is self-care mm -hmm. and vice versa. You know, I wasn't doing the drugs to get high. I was doing the drugs to survive. I was doing the drugs so I can get out of the house. I was doing the drugs so I could do a podcast, so I can get to class, so I could go out and pretend I'm being social and be okay with the red shirt when I'm really not okay with the red shirt because I don't really like these people and they don't like me and I'm forcing myself to be with people that I think I want to be around because I don't know me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that felt like self-care when it was really self-destruction. So I, I can't let that be anywhere on the back burner. I have to remember that my way is not the best way. <laughs> you, <laughs> you know, have, have you been able to successfully keep your type one management now that it's incredibly better? Have you been able to keep that from becoming an addiction? Because that would be bad for you if that happened. Is that right? It would seem like a good thing, but it would be terrible. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and I think when we met, what the problem was, was here I am with the problem that's always been there without a solution. You know, my solution was to ignore it and get high. Well, I choose not to do that. So here I am facing a 400 blood sugar when I haven't eaten all day, you know, and why, and I can't fix it. And that's when I reached out and I found you. And then that led me to Jenny at Integrated Diabetes who taught me how to live. <laughs> Here's the thing. I've had diabetes for 29 years. I don't know how to live with it. No one ever really explained it to me. Like the part that really shocked me was, uh, you know, at that, I'm still on the Omnipod, but like when I said to Jenny, I was like, man, I just, I hit like a 400 every time I switch my pump. And she was like, yeah, you know, anyone struggles with the pump switch. You gotta, you gotta do the tricks. And I'm like, there's tricks. And I remember specifically calling my endocrinologist at that time, a year, maybe two years before that saying, you know what, I, I can't get this to work. Like it takes a day for it to calm back down. And, he, and his response was, well, how long is it taking you to switch the pump? And I could, I could change a pump like a NASCAR. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like I could do it. I could do it driving if I had to. And like, here I am asking for help, which I think I'm asking for help because here, here's the other key piece is when you're molested, you can't say no. <laughs> you don't know how to say no. You don't know how to ask questions correctly. At the time of my molestation, my communication process was interrupted. 
I actually did a year's worth of learning how to communicate with the therapist with other people because I wouldn't get my words out. I'm the guy that's like lit on fire. And I would say, I think I need a glass of water saying, saying I need help is a very difficult thing for me. So, um, you know, it was wonderful having Jenny by my side, teaching me how to live with diabetes because I was dying with it. You know, it's interesting on my side. Um, there's this unspoken thing because Jenny obviously is a, is a healthcare professional and I'm aware that you see her and she's aware that you came to her through me, but we can't talk about you, but we're both really happy for you, but we, oh, but you. we can't, but we can't conversate about it. It's very interesting. Yeah. So, um, she's terrific, obviously. Uh, I'm, she's amazing. Yeah, I'm thrilled that you found her too. I really am. Um, you know what? Do you think you could tell me a little bit about um, recovery now? Like, so I guess you were, when you, when you and I spoke, you were in that kind of spinning out of control phase um, where you thought things were going to go very poorly. And now your diabetes, would you call it like, what, how do you, I guess, what are your goals for, for diabetes day to day? What do you try to accomplish every day? I try to accomplish knowing why my blood sugar is the way it is. I think that's what uh, has always been the issue with me, like not understanding the timing of food, how to count carbs correctly, not knowing that if you eat too much protein, it's going to have a counteraction and you're going to have to extend your insulin for that. Like I couldn't stand that not knowing why I had a 300. You know what I mean? So I try to always know I'm checking right now. I'm 106. <laughs> you know, I like to know why is, why am I 106? Right. Well, I, you know, it's three 33. I'm at the end of the meal. So I'm just running straight on, on basil right now. You know, um, not knowing is the hardest part. I think what recovery has taught me is not to stay stuck on the whys and how to really focus on the how, well, how am I going to get the information to know why I'm 106? You know, so I had to seek help. Um, I think recovery has helped me accept the fact that with my diabetes, it's not going to be smooth sailing every day. There are going to be days that are going to be difficult when I'm sick or when I'm stressed or, you know, a cannula kicks out when you still have 40 units in and you can't switch one and, you know, you're going to have to dump some extra insulin on there. You're going to have to take a shot. Um, I think I always wanted, you know, story of my life. I wanted my problems to go away. I wanted them to not exist. Recovery has helped me accept my diabetes for what it is. And it's allowed me to find the solution. Yeah. You know, it's funny. You just said something that made me realize that, that, I mean, I don't know that it's going to be much of a shock to anybody. This podcast is not very well thought out. I, I don't um, sit down with like a, a pages of notes. Um, when Jenny and I talk about, management stuff. I heard somebody the other day say that the pro tip series in the podcast should be, everyone should have to listen to that. And if I told you, Jenny and I would sit down and I'd be like, Hey, let's talk about pre bolusing today. And that was the extent of our preparation. So I'm not, a, awesome. I'm not a prepper. Okay. And at the same time, I remember saying one time when your blood sugar gets high, you can't spend a bunch of time worrying about why, because there are too many variables. You're never going to figure it out. Like, so just deal with it, get your blood sugar down and start over. Like, I think that a lot of diabetes management, and maybe I haven't ever said this, but I think a lot about diabetes management is just starting clean. Just that sometimes things get completely up and you just have to start over again. And I, think, yeah. you know, it, and, and then when it goes wrong, if you spend all that time running around, just like, oh, I don't know what happened. Like I'm high. I don't know why. I don't know what I did. I ate here. I, and, and you don't realize you're going through all these things that happened to you. You've never been instructed well on how to do any of these things, but yet you're looking at the time you ate and the insulin you used as if they correlate to success or failure when they don't, because they're all wrong. It's just, it's, you're not, no one taught you how to do it correctly. And now here you are taking these things that somebody, you know, quote unquote, taught you, they lead you to these bad outcomes and you keep going back to the broken tools that you think, well, why didn't this work? It didn't work because you're not doing any of it right. Moreover, you don't know what right is. And, and so you make yourself crazy. Like, like it really is terrible. The amount of people I see who just, you know, they're twisted in a knot trying to figure this thing out and they don't have, they don't have any of the puzzle pieces. They have none of them. All they have is the problem. 
it's um it's really it's a it's an invaluable piece of advice you said it about a completely different thing but you just can't spend a ton of time worrying about why sometimes you just gotta but how but like but how do you not when your end result you know what's the biggest fear is that you're going to lose your eyesight or you're going to lose your legs so you sit there and you panic and like it's just crazy to me the amount of bedside manner that really needs to be addressed with endocrinology. Um, you know, at the time when I met Jenny, I guess I'd say about a year, I'm not really good with the time, right. you know, <laughs> I got so much knowledge from four months. Like my A1C went from, I think when I met, when I met you, I was in the nines. When I got to Jenny, I want to say it was eight, five. And that was basically through starvation. Um, I'm sitting at a seven one or seven four right now in like four months of knowledge. Now, don't get me wrong. It took me a while to be able to implement that four months sure. of knowledge. You know what I'm saying? Like it wasn't a quick fix, but like, I was like, I go to the endocrinologist every three months. I used to hate going to the endocrinologist. It was the worst doctor's visit ever. Cause mm-hmm. you just felt like you're being punished. Like you're being told you're doing it wrong and doing it wrong. And we are never getting the, how to do it right. And, uh, yeah, I think, uh, if I could piece everything together and like look at it from the gratitude side, like if I didn't have that moment and never reached out to you, I never would have found Jenny, which gets me to be able to sit here and talk about a very uncomfortable thing that's being recorded and my blood sugar staying stable. Yeah. That's like, great. that's pretty, that's amazing. It's a wonderful testament to where you are. It just yeah. it really is. I, you know, it's funny. You just said it took a while to implement it. And I'm looking at my daughter's friend, uh, her 24 hour graph right now. So I've been helping her for a couple of weeks. I don't really talk to her much anymore. She's, but she's 15. And if you could see how quickly she put it into practice, it's fascinating. And so the, the key is, of course, the way endos talk to people, but also by not making them wait because your anxiety has built and built and built around this for so long. This, girls only had diabetes a, a handful of years. And when I got her first graph, she was over 400 twice a day, every day oh. for a total of eight hours. And I am looking yeah, at you, her, you don't feel real pretty with that. No, 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 no. But she didn't know it. And I'm looking at her 24 hour graph right now. And with the exception of three lows of like 65, which we could argue as to whether or not how low that is. Um, she's, mm, been over 110 twice and mainly between 80 and 100 for the last 24 hours that's amazing but it's just how quickly she picked it up is it, i'm every time i talk to her i'm fascinated by it and i i'll i'll say to her um hey your blood sugar is 130 give yourself 0.15 and i just want you to look back every once in a while over the next two hours just to see how it works and then she watched and i'm like hey you know i'll, I'll say throw a temp basil on watch what happens do this and she learns it right away and then immediately puts it into practice and she said it's it, it's getting easier every day. Like, it's going to yeah. be effortless for her in no time at all. Like, we do people a disservice by not explaining it to them early on. They really deserve to know how to use their insulin right away, you know? Because <laughs> yeah, it's your life, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's, I think the cool part, what I learned with Jenny was... Um, and I, and I took, I take really good notes. I was re if you, I know you can't talk to her, but like, I was really gung ho for this. I actually had to like put a good amount of time and effort into collecting the amount of money to pay for her services. Cause I wasn't working at the time and my God, it was the best gift I could have ever given myself. You know what I'm saying? Like I wanted it so bad and to sit there and I was like, learning all this information and like my pump settings were way off. Like I don't even want to get into it. Like <laughs> I'm way off. And like, so she got everything on track and then it was like right at the end of the four months, I was down at, uh, at the beach with my family and like things started shifting. And I use the word shifting cause I heard her talk about that. Cause it's not a problem. It's a shift, mm-hmm. you know, but right at this moment, it's a problem. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> Oh no, I'm 400 again. Da, 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 da. And then she, and I, I reached out to her and she's like, listen, you're on vacation, different food, different time. Da, 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 da. And I was like, Oh, we talked about this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. And then it was like, wait a second. I have these tools. I have the tools to understand that today I'm going to need to attempt basil because something's off. I don't need to be stuck on the why, but I have the how. Right. And like, that's the cool part is like, I, I don't want to use the word control, but I, I, I know how to control 
where I want my sugar to go. I maybe not can, can control where it's going because I'm a very nervous person. Like I'm very high energy and stress gets me. So sometimes I can't even like calm myself down, (laughs) but I know how to, I know how to, I know how to find the solution with insulin. And that's amazing because like, I didn't like, I didn't even know what temp basil was until I met Jenny and I've had the pump for probably three years at that point. Yeah. That's crazy. Well, the pump companies are at a weird disadvantage too. They are um, allowed by the FDA to sell you the pump. They are not allowed by the FDA to tell you how the pump works. They can tell you what it does, but they can't tell you why you might use it that way. It's now that I, I understand how to use the data with a Dexcom and an Omnipod, like I just feel so empowered. Yeah. Like life is so good. So that's wonderful. I love hearing. I, it's funny. I, I love hearing like how you have like come along so quickly and, and that you, that you hung in for so long. I don't know if you ever give yourself that kind of credit. Like, you know, you, you said something about, you know, a divinity keeping you here, but there's something incredibly strong about you, you know, that, that kept you, they kept you in the game long enough. I'm starting to feel that, yeah. you know, uh, it's hard cause I've never been a person that brags or boasts, you know, if you, if you're going to put it on like an ego scale, I was never one on the end of the bragging. I have it all, but I was on that same scale, just the other end. I'm not good enough. I'm not wanted enough. I can't do this, which is all the same. Yeah. Self pity and ego are basically the same thing, just on the other end. Uh, so I kind of feel like uh, I'm really learning how to sit in the middle and be okay with it. It's very empowering. You told me something that I found shocking a little bit before, um, which is that you didn't you didn't even think of yourself as attractive till recently. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't. I wouldn't say that I am, but um, <laughs> I was in such a bad place in my life that like I didn't even look in the mirror for five years. But Donnie, I, I looked at um, different people in the Coles catalog than you did, but you're a handsome man. So I don't know if that means <laughs> well, as much you, coming from me or not. I'm not certain, but um, <laughs> but but you certainly you certainly are. And so even that like is fascinating. And 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 it's a rehashing between you and I. But I made a joke the last time. It would have been so much smoother if I had just recorded it the first time. But <laughs> but I had joked the first um, you know last time we spoke that I saw pictures of you. Um, you went to New York City for the Gay Pride Parade. And, yes. and I, I don't know what, I don't remember how I joked or what I said at the time, but then you shared with me that you're, are you, I'm still celibate. you're celibate during your recovery because that's how serious you are about your recovery. Um, but that you did get to New York and realize suddenly people were looking at you like, Hey, this is a guy I'm interested in. And that even took you by surprise. Oh yeah. It was definitely an experience. <laughs> so, you know, they say, well, let me back up a step. So the treatment center that I went to, um, the medical doctor who was also gay, um, had come to me and said for the amount of drug use and where I was sitting mentally in life. And I guess I could, I wasn't going to say, it, but I'm going to say, it cause it's such a key piece to this topic you know i was only having sex when i was high Mm -hmm. you take those drugs away and i'm really uncomfortable and if and like knowing my and knowing what had happened well of course it makes perfect sense you know so drugs and love we'll say the word love sex and lust were basically all the same thing i was looking to be loved i wanted to lust and drugs were heavily involved at all times so this medical doctor had told me that I should probably be celibate for the first two years while recovering because it would be so easy to slip up, you know, finding someone that may be attracted to me that wanted to get into a relationship. And if we're at that moment, he goes, well, I'm going to do a little bit of drugs. It would be very difficult for me to say no. Mm-hmm. You couldn't separate those two things. And so yeah. for, for complete clarity, as an adult, you've never been intimate and not altered. Correct. Wow. I'm sorry. I really am. That's, it's okay. No, yeah, that, that's that's okay. uh, that's something. Um, well, I think we're listen. I feel like I know it's weird and we're older and stuff, but you know, once you get through your recovery, I, I'd like a text message that said I got laid. <laughs> <laughs> <Just so> I can... <laughs> listen, I already have my hotel booked for next summer <laughs> for Pride. I'm very excited. All right, so you know, let's, so we should just say right now, uh, gay men in the New York area, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> 
because Donnie's coming, uh, figuratively and literally next summer. <laughs> so, oh my god! <laughs> is that how does that feel? Does it feel like a goal? Like, does it feel like Christmas? You know what it feels like is that I finally love myself. Exactly. This has given me a piece of me that I've always wanted, and I think. Uh, once I got past that part of something was taken away from me and I'll never get it back. And that I learned that I can work around this and fill it with something I can't take back. I can't get back what was taken away from me. Mm -hmm. It's never going to happen. Time, the innocence, all of that. But I can live a really good life understanding that I could fill it with uh, something that I create. Yeah. And what I'm in right now is a creative process. <clears throat> You know, I can't even tell you how happy I am that I wake up every day and I love myself and I want to get up and I want to do, I want to, you know what, I'm not trying to be a good person. I just want to be a better person than I was yesterday. Yeah. And that's with me. That's with the people around me and what I'm trying to do with my life. And, and, I, okay. and that's a really good feeling. Yeah. I want to finish up with that a little bit too. So you made a, uh, a fairly large shift in your professional life. Um, yes. I'd love to know how you, how you came to that decision. Um, so how did I come to, hmm. um, so when I went to treatment, I felt so good so quickly that I never wanted to leave, <laughs> you know? So I stayed connected with the treatment center and I actually work there now. And I am actually back in school getting my bachelor's in human services with a concentration on addiction counseling and most likely will get my master's in social work to become a counselor. That's wonderful. That is really great. And even in that interim, while you're in school, you're working there doing the jobs you, you are qualified for. So you're going to be a ground up. You really are going to be, you're going to be the guy who one day is the CEO who started in the mailroom, like that feeling. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. I feel like I'm starting in the mailroom of a fortune 500 company yeah. and just working my way up. That's so cool. It's, it's, um, you feel like you're doing it for, is it a little for you, a little for them? Is it all like, do you know what I mean? Like, are you, would you, are you afraid, were you afraid to leave that place uh, so much so that you're like, I need to stay here, even if it's professionally, or was it a real feeling of this place helped me so much? I want to give back. It's a real feeling of this place helped me so much that I want to give back. That's nice. Um, you know, to keep what I have, I have to give it away. Okay. And selfishly, I want to keep everything I have, yeah. if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it does. Finally, I'm finally sitting in a place in my life that I really enjoyed my life, and I'm not faking it on the outside, that I'm never going to give this up. Yeah. This is my seat. And whatever I need to do to stay here, I'm going to. And, you know, I work a Narcotics Anonymous program, and, you know, it is a spiritual program, and there are some mechanics of it that aren't spiritual you know you talk to people you go to meetings and you give back and when i give back the amount of love and clarity and happiness that i feel about my purpose in life is so strong that i just want to continue to give back i i have to say i understand that i um i, I did this thing because someone asked me to right they i was asked uh, would i make a a private Facebook group where people who listen to the podcast could talk about diabetes. And I resisted it for a very long time because I did not want to be responsible for that space. Sure. And one day I just thought, you know what? They're adults, right? I'm, I'm going to give it to them and then they can do what they're going to do with it. If they ruin it, we'll throw it away. And if they don't, we'll have something beautiful. And the other day, I was able to go on and I don't go there that often. Like I, I kind of bang through sometimes and I'm like, way to go. That's amazing. Good job. Like that kind of stuff. Cause I don't really, I don't have the time. Um, Donnie, hold on. I lost you. No, I'm here. Donnie, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hello. Well, the good news. Hello. Is, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. The good news is, is that That's okay. our, our entire recording is safe. I just don't know what happened. Um, <laughs> I was like, if you call back, 
Donnie, start again. <laughs> Tell me about being molested, would you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this I'll guy's knock you, funny. I'll knock you right out of that celibacy, Donnie. Give me one more try. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're no. going to need you to do this better. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. First of all, we're wrapping up, but I, I, I wanted to. I didn't want to just let it die there. But sure. Um, so I was saying that I, I started this space and. In kind of short order, it has over two thousand people in it, and yeah. but but that's not what's amazing about it. that's a fairly small number for a Facebook group. What's amazing about it is not one blocked account, not one disagreement that they haven't resolved on their own. Like it's really like minded, thoughtful people trying to help other people with their diabetes. Scott, think about the person that tagged you to get to me who didn't even know me you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. like it's awesome well my goal my so listen i would never say it out loud you know you don't say what you mean to do when you start it but when when i thought okay let me give this a try like i'll put these people together my goal is is that is that people don't leave the space. So like i know it's it's fun to listen to the podcast and be like oh scott he's really good with insulin and stuff but there are a lot of people who are very good with insulin. Not a lot of people stay behind to tell someone else about it, right? Like that's, okay. that, and so I'm trying to create a group of people who don't leave, who who stay and support people. And that's how your story made me feel about when you said, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to become a, I'm going to become a drug counselor. I'm going to become a therapist. I'm going to get my, my master's degree. I'm going to help more people. Like, like you went through the fight. And now you could just walk away and be like, yeah, all right, well, the rest of you, good luck, you, you know, but, but that's not what you're doing. I think that's a really big deal. I'm, I'm, it, it makes me feel proud to know you, you know. I appreciate that. That's yeah. really, really nice of you to say. I think, um, <clears throat> you know, if I was going to put, write this down in a nutshell on like what in the world and why, you know, um, I don't think... You know, I do know. Um, I went through this because I was supposed to. And like, I got here because I'm supposed to help someone else get through it. Because there had been too many times that I was about ready to jump ship and, and, and end this all and be done with it. And I could have ended up in jail. There have been situations I could have been killed in. There many, many, many out. You know what I'm saying? And it never happened. And it happened for a reason because I'm supposed to be doing things like this. You know, like I had mentioned earlier, my anxiety was so bad that I couldn't pass college. And like, all I do is speak. And like, I just spoke at a medical college to the graduating class of 115 doctors about addiction and bedside manner and how to talk to people and things like that. And I speak regularly at meetings and I do support groups and um, it's because people need to know that there's a, there's a way out, mm -hmm. you know, and if I don't talk about how I got out, it's not going to be available to the next person. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And like, I think that's what this world is all about. We're supposed to stay connected and help each other. And yeah. for some reason we forget that at times. Yeah. Move forward, continue to move forward and help other people move forward. And Absolutely. Because your story is uncommon. And, and so therefore there are not as many people left at the end to retell that story. So if there aren't as many people to retell that story and those few people decide not to retell it, then everyone's stuck starting over all the time and just left to the randomness. And I, I don't know. I think that's great. I think about diabetes the exact same way. I, I've said it before. I, I, I can picture myself standing in a shower, crying, thinking I'm killing my daughter because of the very things that you said about not understanding how to use your insulin, just the same situation that everyone's in. And it feels to me just very wrong to look back at everybody and just go like, I figured it out. Good luck, suckers. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, like, yeah. Woo, I'm out of here. And, and don't get me wrong. There's some days where I'm like, oh, I said diabetes one too many times today, you, you, you know, but not God, enough. I say the same thing about recovery. Yeah, right. I right. do, you know, but like to think like, and I'm not, and I hope this doesn't come across wrong, but like, you don't have diabetes. You don't know what it's like. And you saved my life. You helped save my life. 
You know what I mean? I'm like internally grateful for that because what you did and what you're doing for people, you didn't do this, you know, in your head going, you know what? In three years, I'm going to help some guy get off the drugs and not kill himself. I I know that wasn't in your head, but what you're doing and your love and your passion for what you do, the ripple effect got to me. And then my ripple effect hopefully will get to the next person. And that's what I'm trying to do. That's lovely. I just didn't want people to cry in the shower, honestly. It's a sad place to cry. Um, it it just, you know, it, it really is. I and, and really, the shower was me. I was hiding. Like, my wife would come home and be like, how was your day? And I'd be like, I was great. Everything's fine. She's doing great. You know, I didn't get a chance to take a shower. Let me just jump in the shower before dinner. And then I would just jump in the shower and the pressure and stress of keeping a kid alive all day with diabetes when I didn't know what the hell I was doing, I had, I, ex- I would explode and then I'd pull myself back together and, and do it again, y- you know, and it's just, it's just, nobody deserves to feel that way when there's no reason that you should have to feel that way. Like there's some bad stuff in life we all have to go through, but you know, it just, just seems obvious like, why, you know, I don't, you know, for reasons that I think we've all, you know, hashed and rehashed over and over again, people don't tell people about how to manage their diabetes. Doctors don't, you know, other friends don't like, it's just not what happens. Right. I, I just, it, that's unnecessary. So. And it, and, and, and it affects every other portion of your life. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like it affects your happiness, your sadness, your mood swings, how you eat, how you live, How do you communicate with people about, can I go to dinner? Well, what time are we going to dinner? You know, uh, everything. I mean, everything. I would challenge uh, any healthcare professional that helps people with diabetes to go back and take 300 hours and listen to this show and then tell me that your first words to a person with diabetes shouldn't be, hey, this sucks. Sorry. It's going to be all right. Pay attention. Here's how insulin works. And here's how you're going to use these tools to make it work for you. If that's not why, if you can listen to this and not come to the conclusion that that's how you should be speaking to people, then you have a much different idea of people's happiness and health than I do. And and they're in the wrong profession. Yeah, a (laughs) hundred percent. Right. And and that, that does exist too. You got to be careful. You know, sometimes, sometimes, you know, three three strikes and you got to change doctors. (laughs) And I'm glad you had said that because I did want to touch on this. Um, you know, when I had met Jenny and worked with her and the amount of, I don't even want to say care. Cause if anyone knows Jenny, she's amazing. Like I honestly, I would move next to her and want to be next to her and have every meal at her dinner table. Cause she's <laughs> that, I mean, she's so yeah. knowledgeable and she's just such a good person. Right. Like it was like, Oh, it's just so awesome to, have, to be able to connect with her for four months and like, feel good about myself and have someone in my corner that like really felt like a team player and was like rooting me on. It was, it was a game changer for me. Um, but I had learned so much from that little amount of time that when I went back to my endo, which did not take it very well that I got outside help Mm -hmm. in the beginning, they were all for it. But when I came with my new pump settings, they didn't even want to look at them. And I actually was told we're, we'll call you when we go over these changes and we'll be in touch with you. And I never heard back from them. So from going from working with Jenny and understanding that's not right, yeah. I'm not being treated right. I had the courage to find another doctor. And I actually have a, uh, uh, an endocrinologist right now who is a type one. And it's like the best relationship ever. Like, But I would never have known anything different right. if I had not Met her. started this process. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because I didn't know anything different. You know how dis- how discouraging it is to see an endocrinologist make a pump change and say, get your blood work done. We'll see you in three months. Mm. You want my blood work done today? You just made the changes 30 seconds ago in my pump. That's What, what are you talking about? Gonna, you know what I mean? Like that's <laughs> it's like, I know better than that. And you're the paid professional. Yeah. You know, so it's, uh, I don't know. I'm super lucky that this process has found, I was able to find my tribe. I was able to find my recovery. I was able to build a community around me to support me and want me to do better instead of pulling me backwards. And like, I'm super grateful you're part of it, man. Thank you. It means a lot to me. I'm thrilled that we, that we met. It was, you know, obviously just random and I, I will never know who that person was. I don't think that, that, that put us in touch, but, uh, 
I'm, I'm glad it happened. I really am. And, and f- for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that you came on here and did this twice. And, and I, know this wasn't, <laughs> and I know this wasn't easy for you. Um, you know, even though you are speaking in public, like, this is recorded, it's different. And, yeah, it, it is different. Yeah. And, and at the same time, I can just tell, like I can hear in your, I can hear your words and I know how it's going to hit different people who are in not your exact situation, but in funny ways are in your exact situation. Sure. Now, and I'm looking forward to those people, even though I won't meet most of them having those little like celebration moments. Like you've said so many things along this, this hour and a half where I feel like someone should be standing behind you, like blowing up balloons and like throwing confetti up in the air. Like just, just the smallest thing. Like I switched doctors. Like if, if you have been listening for the last, I don't know how long and you've heard, you know, Donnie's journey and how he, he's been impacted by it psychologically. Switching doctors is something you probably couldn't have done two years ago. No, right? No, 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 yeah. not at all. Right? No, it's just amazing. It really is wonderful. I mean, you're such a you're such a, a happy story. I mean, you're, it seems like it isn't, but it really it, it really is. It's just a wonderfully happy story. And you have something. I, I'd like to leave you with this from me. I I think you have something. I don't know if it'll ever make up for the things that happened to you or the things you've been through. But I think you have perspective and context that not many people get to have. And and I think that's valuable. And and, and I bet you it's going to pay you back in a number of different ways for the rest of your life. So, and other people as well. Wow. Thank you. No, uh, it, it's, it's worth, it's, it, it can't be, we can never say any of that was worth it, but you have a super, but I was, but I was supposed to go through it. Hundred percent. You have a superpower now. Uh, some of us don't get. You know, and you started wow. this conversation talking about Anne and how she came on. Anne has that power too. Yeah, she does. She yeah. just if you don't see the if you don't see the relation between her and you, you're not you're not looking closely enough. You, you know, so um, that's re- it's a, it's a wonderful thing. I think it'll serve you a, a million different ways wonderfully. So I'm I appreciate that. It's done a lot for me already. So I'm I'm. I'm lucky to be here. I'm grateful to be here, you know, and I don't go through life trying to get or have anything more than I already have because what I have is enough. Mm. And that's what I've always ever just wanted (laughs) was just to be enough, you know? And I think there's definitely going to be some people out there that are going to connect on the level of what happened to me as a child. And if they never uh, address it publicly, I hope that they can get a little bit amount of healing from hearing it through me. Yeah. No, I think they will. I, I, I think you're you're maybe the exact right person to to pass that information to other people. You just you have a way of while we're talking, you're accessing things that should that are and should be painful, and you're explaining them in a way that I can understand. Um, yeah, and and it feels like it's moving me forward in my understanding of of these things. And I think once you get into a room with other people who have had those similar experiences it's going to resonate with them, you know, a million times over. And, and you're going to stand in front of them as the example of it could really work out for you. You know, I really appreciate that. You know, um, there's also a level of healing that happens on my end as well. So I do appreciate the opportunity to heal just a little bit more today. You know, no, I appreciate it too. And I, and I, I will, I will mimic mirror that right back to you by telling you that I, you know, I see the notes I know the podcast helps people. The very not secret secret at this point is helps me way more than it helps you. It helps me with diabetes and my daughter, but it helps me personally too. Like I, sure. I am, I am such a better listener than I was five years ago. Right. And I actually uh, have a voice today. Yeah. And uh, I try, I try to use it wisely, you know. I think you are. I, this is wonderful. Well, well, let's not sit and kiss each other's asses. Let's just say, <laughs> let's say, here's what's going to happen. You've recorded two podcasts to get one out. That was nice. Um, and we're all rooting. I think we're all rooting for you to go to New York and have a ton of really guilt-free sex. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That just got real uncomfortable. Thanks, no, 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 I, think, I think everyone <laughs> listening is like, oh, my God, I need to stay at least alive till the summer to find out if... What happens if to Donnie? Wants at to the put party? a GoFundMe <laughs> account together to help pay for my hotel because it's expensive. I thought you were going to say condoms. I thought you were going to say condoms. <laughs> <laughs>
I a hundred percent thought you were gonna say condoms. Damn it! Uh, this, this, this is now sponsored by Trojan. <laughs> hey, listen, if we can get an ad from Trojan, I'll take it. I just. <laughs> 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 oh my god all right listen uh, i'm gonna say goodbye and let's say goodbye to you like a person after the recording is over so thank sure. you so much for doing this i really appreciate it thank you scott huge thanks to donnie for coming on the show and sharing so much of his story with us it could not have been easy and you know what in honor of the after dark series and the bleeping out that's gone through let me say this I want to f- thank Dexcom for being the best f- CGM in the whole f- world. And to Omnipod, whoever over there figured out to make a tubeless insulin pump, you're a f- damn m- genius. Go to Dexcom.com forward slash juice box and myomnipod.com forward slash juice box to find out more. And if you want to see a lot of people doing some really good work, go to touchedbytype1.org. I'm not going to curse about them, although I think that what they do is absolutely f***ing amazing. You motherfuckers know what to do. Go support the sponsors. Don't break my balls. If you're currently struggling with addiction, please reach out to someone for help. It could be a treatment center, a hospital, a family member, a loved one, or strangers on Facebook. No matter how dire things feel, I believe you could make it to the other side. You just might need some help. If you suspect child maltreatment, you can go to the Child Welfare Information Gateway. It's at childwelfare.gov. That page will explain how to report suspected child abuse or neglect.